Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, a podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 104, March 13th to March 19th, 1863. Last week, we talked about the Confederate impressment law as the rebels are in need of acquiring more material for their war effort. We also gave John Singleton Mosby and his Rangers a proper rundown. We got to take a snapshot of the Partisan Rangers in Virginia as well, having a nice little sample size in the Fairfax County Courthouse raid. This week, I want to mop up some introductions of major figures we really have not gotten to, either because they are yet to make an impact, or simply because I have neglected them. We're going to check in on what is going on in North Carolina as well, but first we will look into James Longstreet and his Overlook campaign into the Tidewater region. Of course, before we talk about uh, Lee's old war horse here, I do want to mention that there is Patreon content that is posted. This month it's going to be John Singleton Mosby's memoir review. So that pairs very nicely with some of the things we've been talking about, whether that's with guerrillas and partisan rangers or even the Fairfax courthouse raid that we talked about last week. So it pairs very nicely with that, I think. And it's a little bit different of a memoir review. It's a little bit different than some of the others that we've done. And I think it also compares very nicely with the memoir review we did with Rufus Dawes last week. So if that sounds like something that would interest you, there is a link to the Patreon. And again, for as little as a dollar a month, you get an extra episode. And the proceeds do go toward the general upkeep of the show. And they are greatly appreciated. So thank you very much. So the strategic situation, if we recall in the East, is still that the armies are staring across the Rappahannock at one another. Joe Hooker had taken over the Army of the Potomac, and much like his counterpart Lee, had settled into winter quarters. Remember though that Central Virginia was already having issues supplying the armies. This problem, as we have discussed, was alleviated with the stationary nature of the winter encampments, but as the army sat, there would be movement further south by soldiers under Longstreet. Longstreet would have under his command a division under Pickett, one under Hood, and a third under Samuel French, all of which would be sent further south to Richmond. Samuel French is actually an interesting character. He was born in New Jersey and served in the war with Mexico, being wounded at Buena Vista. Following the war, he received a plantation as part of his marriage in Mississippi. French will serve throughout the war and eventually go back to planting in Florida until his death. His is an interesting tale, and I think it illustrates that although he was a northerner by birth, his way of life is changed through his marriage and, importantly, how he gains his wealth, likewise, is changed too. When war breaks out, he will side with the Confederacy as a result. In his memoir, French will mention that he was one of some 26 or so northern-born officers in the Confederacy, and that they believed in the right to secede from the Union. Whatever his reasoning, it was probably not an easy decision. He was hanged in effigy by citizens outside his New Jersey summer home. Now we have talked many times about there being a political nature on both sides during the war. Longstreet would align himself with Joseph Johnson in a section of officers who believed that the focus of the war should be shifted to the West. This would be known as the Western Bloc. Longstreet was a faithful soldier, especially to his commander Robert E. Lee, and there really is no evidence to the contrary. This would be why Lee would refer to Pete as his old war horse. But there is also an area of Longstreet that would seek an independent command, 
especially in the West. Later in the year, when he is sent to reinforce Braxton Bragg in northern Georgia, he is fully expecting to take command away from the disappointing general, who now two times had an opportunity to perform better on the battlefield. Unfortunately for Longstreet, he's not going to necessarily perform well when he gets down there. Had he been a little above the very political and clicky nature of the army down there, and if he had actually performed well on the battlefield and in an opportunity that he does receive an independent command, he may very well have been uh, placed as the new commander of the Army of Tennessee. Now, there would have been some complications in there, so it's not necessarily a foregone conclusion. There's always the issue of rank and uh, date of commission that we always see, especially with these Civil War generals. But we're going to get there in due time. Don't worry. Lee is going to run with Longstreet's idea that the army could be separated, with one wing staying on the line and the other operating away. Longstreet and his men would be kept in a position where not only could they support Lee if he got into trouble, but they could also defend the capital if necessary. Longstreet was already hankering to move on his own. This is true, but his selection probably also came by Lee because Stonewall was a little bit of a loose cannon, who would most likely accrue casualties if he was left to his own devices. And it's true, and you know, once again, I'm sort of teasing what we'll be talking about here uh, later in the year, but it, when Longstreet does get to his independent command, he doesn't really take a whole lot of chances. So Lee is right in that regard. And in some ways, he's not going to be good in an independent command because he's not going to take as many chances where there could be casualties that get accrued. So and once again, Lee's got him kind of pegged there. The southern part of the state of Virginia had much more to offer in terms of supply in cattle and corn. Already, Lee had dispersed his horses, whether for artillery or cavalry, to find a better fodder areas. This would weaken his artillery base and cavalry, but would partially solve the problem. Longstreet's men not taking rations from the Army of Northern Virginia was also a positive. There's going to be supply problems for the Confederacy as a whole that we should mention, Braxton Bragg's army is going to feel these constraints. He's going to mostly have to forage for sustenance for his soldiers because even though he's closer to Atlanta than Lee is, any supplies that are in Atlanta are probably going north toward the Army of Northern Virginia. So if you can imagine, then that's kind of having a trickle-down effect on the rest of the Confederacy. And while... It might be true there could have been some supplies that could have gone around. Uh, there certainly is a lack of transportation that can get it to the armies, right? We mentioned how the South doesn't have as many railroads, and we mentioned how sort of as a result with these impressment laws, even though they're bringing on war material that can be used, some of it is going to waste because it just can't get to where it needs to go. Longstreet's wing would gather supplies necessary to keep the army alive as well as themselves. Additionally, there could be further connection with North Carolina. You see, there is still a federal presence there, and a larger Confederate force in the area would at the minimum keep officials from that state from jumping off the deep end. While maybe not officially stated, we can draw a big conclusion from Longstreet being relocated closer to the Tar Heel State. Remember that North Carolina's secession from the Union was not unanimous, as it was in other states of the South. We discussed this when mentioning the states in the Upper South, and how they had cultural and economic ties that were closer to the Northern states than their deeper South counterparts. Additionally, the mountain country in North Carolina was full of irregular activity against conscription and now, of course, impressment. Jefferson Davis has a balancing act with the South, trying to protect all the states 
who especially now in 1863 are having Yankee occupying forces sitting in them. With many of the forces stripped to fight elsewhere, these states would be concerned about the lack of attention given to them. It's always interesting to have these what-if scenarios that I've mentioned, and one of them that gets mentioned is that Jefferson Davis was probably going to have a hard time keeping together the Confederacy anyway. And even if somehow they had been able to win the Civil War, or at least win in the sense that they gain independence, he probably would have had some splintering off of that Confederacy. So it's very interesting to kind of look at. And if there had not been this war effort, if there had not been war, you know, is North Carolina really going to agree with what else is going on with the other states in the South? That's an interesting thing that we can ponder. We certainly had growing pains in this country when it gained independence, uh, even in the 1700s. So to see the kind of growing pains that an independent confederacy would have and what those would look like would be certainly not all sunshine and roses. We have highlighted that there are several states who needed irregular forces to do the bulk of the work to harass and fight off the invaders. While this move by Longstreet could be some positive press that was much needed by the Davis administration. While the war is not necessarily a foregone conclusion as being lost by the South, it certainly is not necessarily looking like a very positive venture either. We will talk about Longstreet and his operations in the Tidewater region moving forward, but just keep in mind that this is a fairly successful foraging move that's going to pay off for Lee. So while Longstreet operates in Virginia, D.H. Hill is operating as the commander of the North Carolina District. Now, if you remember New Bern from some of our earlier episodes, it was captured already by the Union forces under Ambrose Burnside, moving up from their successful capture of Roanoke Island. Well, if you recall when we talked about that city, it was actually a fairly large one and important to the state and their coastal defense. So D.H. Hill, commanding some 12,000 men, would attempt to retake the North Carolinian city. His forces include a brigade of troops under James Pettigrew. James Pettigrew was a North Carolina native who graduated from university at 15, receiving a teaching role at the Naval Observatory by President Polk as a result. From there, Pettigrew will go on to practice law and join early militia units in 1861, elected as an officer. Now, Pettigrew was a brigade commander, but will go on to command a division at Gettysburg. While he's actually filling in for his division commander, who is wounded on the first day, this is actually the division that's going to participate in what is known as Pickett's Charge. Well, as you can imagine, there is some controversy there because Pettigrew is not named in the famous charge. His major fault, perhaps, is that he's killed shortly after Gettysburg in Maryland, so he's no longer an advocate for the performance of his troops. Just as many North Carolinians under Pettigrew participate in the charge as the Virginians under Pickett do. Now there's very much a Pickett-Pettigrew charge name change motion. There's also Pickett-Pettigrew-Trimble name of the charge at Gettysburg, and neither of those really ring off the tongue to me anyway, so I'm not going to necessarily use those. I'm just going to use Pickett's charge, but certainly we are not there yet by any means, although Gettysburg is right around the corner here. I'm sure we're going to talk more about that in July. Just keep that in the back of your minds for now. In 1863, Pettigrew's brigade would move on New Bern and run into Union forces at a place called Deep Gully on March 13th. Skirmishing would force the Union troops back to a fortified position known as Fort Anderson. Despite the strong position, Pettigrew still potentially held an advantage against their enemy, 
If he managed to press that advantage, he might have completed Hill's objective of recapturing New Bern. However, the Union commander Hiram Anderson would offer a truce to the rebels. There would be some deception, as the reason given for the truce was that Anderson needed to confer with his superior officer. During that time, Anderson was able to move Union gunboats in a position to support and make the attack much harder for the rebels. Remember that the News River runs right by New Bern. Pettigrew would spot the deception and move to attack the Union line. Unfortunately for him, though, the gunboats would have a desired effect and dissuade the rebels from pressing their luck. William Chase Whiting was supposed to bring up additional troops and valuable guns from Wilmington where he was commanding. These would have been very useful for a potential assault on Fort Anderson and could have maybe tipped the balance for the South so that they could take back New Bern. As it was, Pettigrew would pull his men back. D.H. Hill, likewise, would move to Washington, North Carolina to regroup. His men had accomplished more for foraging, adding to the haul that Longstreet was seeing further to the north. We will continue with further action in North Carolina as this campaign progresses. Now, we did introduce John Singleton Mosby very briefly a while back, and now again last episode. This actually got me thinking that there are some individuals in our story who are yet to play a role, or maybe even have already played a role, and we've not really had the need to mention them. Sometimes I will admit, with the larger battle narratives, I find it hard to go back and explain who exactly these people are. Like, I know who Harry Hayes is, but do all of you know who Harry Hayes is? It's a fair question. We're going to start with who I think is the biggest name on the list in Jubal Early. We talked about how Early writes a memoir after the war, and he's very critical of James Longstreet, but really didn't give him an introduction. Early was born in Virginia and actually attended West Point, seeing some service in the Seminole War before resigning. He will go on to command troops, a major in the Mexican-American War, before going into politics. In politics, he's going to serve in the Virginia House of Delegates. It is here where Early actually votes against secession. This is pretty wild, considering he is credited with as being one of the main contributors to the Lost Cause narrative. If you recall, though, there was a good amount of opposition to the war in Virginia. Early will become a colonel in a Virginia regiment, serving at First Manassas. He will then serve throughout the Eastern Theater and eventually receive an independent command in the Shenandoah Valley, where he is going to launch the fourth and least well-known invasion of the North. After being defeated soundly by Sheridan in the Valley, Early will flee to Mexico rather than surrender. He's actually going to be essentially removed by Lee. Lee, who gives Jubal Early a nickname, he doesn't really do that with officers that he doesn't like, is going to realize that he's kind of spent by the time Sheridan thrashes him in the valley. He's not really going to be useful anymore. So he serves out the rest of the war on the bench. After the conclusion of the war, he's going to return to practice law and become the first president of the Virginia Historical Society, where, of course, he writes about Longstreet. Now, we do need to mention Longstreet and how he is not well liked by some of his fellow officers. Yeah, we mentioned when we talked about introducing Longstreet that he does a good job of becoming a Republican and melding back into that society, whereas there's very much a still a warlike presence almost with certain individuals who served. Early is going to be one of them, so he's going to see Longstreet as a traitor, and because of that, he's going to write about how it's Longstreet who loses the Battle of Gettysburg, and we'll get there. We'll talk about it, and you know, Longstreet certainly is not without his faults. It's not really all his fault either, so he's able to use the pen and shape some of the opinions that we have, even to this day, even. 
Speaking of Harry T. Hayes, I will go ahead and mention him too. Hayes was Tennessee born, but grew up in Mississippi. He would practice law in Baltimore before setting up a practice in New Orleans. During the Mexican-American War, he would serve as a volunteer, becoming a prominent Whig afterwards. The Whig Party is actually the same party that Abraham Lincoln is in, so it's interesting that he's not a Democrat, right? We always think that all these Southerners are Democrats. Hayes has actually served in the 7th Louisiana, where he fought at first Manassas and then in the Valley Campaign. During that campaign, he is wounded at Port Republic. He's going to perform well as an officer in the upcoming campaigns, being wounded again at Spotsylvania. After the war, he will become a sheriff in Louisiana, but will be removed by little Phil Sheridan. Hayes is going to then practice law until his death. I'd like to also mention Henry Benning, who was a Georgia politician, who was very much a Democrat for the Southern cause. Rock Benning, as he's going to be known, would give a speech talking about how the black race would take over and most notably shuddered at the fact that Senator Charles Sumner or even Frederick Douglass would become president. He's going to lead troops in the East during the war. If you've ever heard of Fort Benning in Georgia, it's actually named after him. At least at the time of this recording, it is still named Fort Benning because I think there there is actually a name change under consideration. Fort Benning is actually the site of the U.S. Army Infantry School. So if you're listening to this and there's no Fort Benning, but you know where the U.S. Army Infantry School is, assuming that hasn't moved as well, uh, that's, that's where we were talking about, I should say. Let's also introduce Jerome Robertson. He will be the new commander of the Texas Brigade, Hood being elevated to division command. Robertson was born in Kentucky, but moved to Texas and was involved in the independence movement prior to the Civil War. He's actually involved in fighting against subsequent Mexican invasions of the Texas Republic following the famous incidents of 1836. Serving in the Confederate Army, Robertson will go on to command the already-mentioned Texas Brigade before being removed by Longstreet after Chickamauga. He would go on to Texas and command in that district before the war's conclusion. Robertson doesn't necessarily get along with some of his other officers, Longstreet included, so there is going to be that mark against him. I do want to also mention John Bowen. Now, the pattern here that you may realize is that I'm trying to do the best I can to set up a little in advance for the upcoming Vicksburg and Gettysburg campaigns with some of these introductions, and John Bowen is no exception. He's probably going to be the most capable officer that Pemberton has in his army, proving it many times on the battlefield. Bowen was born in Savannah before attending West Point. He would find himself in St. Louis during the outbreak of the war and be captured during the Camp Jackson Affair. He will be promoted to Major General during his service before dying of illness just following the fall of Vicksburg. We do have a couple individuals from the Union side as well. Andrew Humphreys we met briefly at Fredericksburg. He was a Philadelphia native who attended West Point. He spent some time in the topographical engineers, just like Meade. Remember, if you were in the topographical engineers, that means you were exceptionally smart. West Point, during the Civil War, not necessarily being all about tactics and whatnot. That's why everyone pretty much has the same tactics, right? Uh, But you were doing a lot of math. So if you were graduating at the top of your class, if you were going into the engineers, that meant you were very good at it. So for me... I would actually probably be on the frontier or serving in the infantry, as opposed to the topographical engineers, I should say. He had connected with George B. McClellan and was on his staff during the Peninsula Campaign. 
He will go on to serve as a division commander under Sickles at Gettysburg and then chief of staff for Meade's command. Afterwards, he would take command of a corps until the end of the war. After the conflict, he will continue to serve in the army, dying in 1883. We should also mention David Burney, son of a prominent abolition advocate. Burney practiced law before the war and would begin as a lieutenant colonel in a Pennsylvania regiment. We've actually met him before, Burney rising to command a brigade in Kearney's division during the peninsula. Burney was actually court-martialed after the Battle of Seven Pines for stopping his command short of engaging the enemy. He was acquitted, as the orders were a misunderstanding. Again, he was surrounded by controversy after Fredericksburg, if you recall, he had his division in reserve, but was not engaged. Bernie will take over command from Sickles at Gettysburg, but die of malaria in 1864 while serving in the Overland Campaign. We also mentioned George Crook very briefly in a previous episode. Crook was an Ohio native and West Point graduate who spent time out in California before the outbreak of the Civil War. We actually met him during the Antietam campaign at Burnside's Bridge, if you recall. Crook will then command cavalry for George Thomas before being assigned to Western Virginia. We mentioned that during this time, he would be captured by members of McNeil's Rangers. After the war, he will serve on the frontier, fighting against native tribes, most notably the Chiricahua Apaches, who had a leader named Geronimo. He would die in 1890. Finally, we do need to talk about John Buford. Now, Buford is one of my favorite figures from Gettysburg, so I will try not to dwell on him too much and wait for the actual episodes we will have on that battle. Buford, though, is such an unlikely hero that I can't help but root for him. If you see the movie Gettysburg, Sam Elliott actually plays him in that classic, and... I really can't unsee that, so whenever I picture Buford, even though I've seen photographs of the guy, I just picture Sam Elliott, so I think that's a very nice pairing there. Buford was a Kentucky native. His, like other Kentucky families, was very divided, with a cousin serving in the Confederate Army. Buford would attend West Point before being stationed on the frontier. He's actually going to be given command of the Reserve Cavalry and John Pope's Army of Virginia. Commanding cavalry during the Maryland Campaign, as well as Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville, he's really going to have an opportunity during Gettysburg. After Gettysburg, Buford unfortunately would die, most likely of typhoid. I know we probably need to do more in terms of introductions, but I know at least we have mentioned a few of these names in the course of our episodes, so it's nice to have a little circle back and talk about them a little bit more in depth. Let's close out by talking about St. Patrick's Day celebrations that were put on by the Army of the Potomac, specifically the Irish Brigade. Thomas Francis Marr was many things, including a lover of a good time. He hosted on St. Patrick's Day a celebration in the Army that included many events, including horse racing, which is advertised as such. To come off the 17th March, rain or shine by horses, the property of, and to be ridden by, commissioned officers of that brigade. The prizes are a purse of $500, second horse to save his stakes, two and a half mile heat, best two and three, over four hurdles, four and a half feet high, and five ditch fences, including two artificial rivers, 15 feet wide and six deep. Hurdles to be made of forest pine embraced with hoops. There were other activities, including climbing a greased pole with $50 and a furlough at the top. It is described as well. One tall stout fellow made a desperate effort to lift himself from the ground and after trying for about half an hour, was reluctantly compelled to give up, having in that time only achieved about an inch. He looked wistfully at the paper fluttering above him, 
and then turned away to give room to an ambitious youngster, who succeeded in getting halfway up, when, coming to a spot greasier than the rest, he began to slip, and did not pause until he came to the ground, amid the roars of the crowd. While not exactly turning a river green, the events seemed very lively, and other accounts list it as an unforgettable time. Of course, alcohol was applied amongst the officers and men liberally, two drinks apparently being the opening ration. No one was sober at the conclusion, reportedly. This gives us a glimpse into the lighter side of things and what could potentially break the monotony of camp life. I also say if you're going out to a celebration for St. Patrick's Day, you can justify it in that you're simply doing the same things that a Civil War soldier would have done, even if you're not climbing any greased poles or doing some seemingly dangerous horse racing with a lot of jumps and uh, whatnot there. So <laughs> there you go. So we will go ahead and call it quits for now. This week, we talked about the beginning of action in the Tidewater region for James Longstreet. We had a skirmish at Fort Anderson and Deep Gully in North Carolina connected to those actions. There were a handful more introductions that we have maybe missed during the course of our narrative, and we racked up a couple today. Next week, we're going to talk briefly about Florida before we head over for some action in Tennessee. If you like what you hear, please make sure to leave a review. Posted in the description should be a link to the website, Patreon, as well as Venmo information. And of course, your support for the general upkeep of the show is greatly appreciated. Feedback is always welcome. Questions, comments, concerns. The email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. Thank you all so much for listening and have a great week. <laughs>